You're a private investigator in a small town near Athens, Georgia. You handle small town problems, insurance fraud, child custody, marital affairs. Work is simple, but fulfilling. One afternoon in March of 2019, a young man walks into your practice. He seems worried. He says his name is Jimmy. Someone broke into his house and stole one million dollars, 400,000 in cash, and 150 bitcoins, worth roughly $600,000 at the time. He says only a few people, some close friends, knew the hiding place. He wants you to find who did this. After listening, one question is on your mind. What is a Bitcoin? For 1,500 years, the Silk Road was a network of ancient trade routes linking together the civilizations of Rome and China. Merchants traveled across treacherous lands and vast seas to these new markets, and with them, they brought cocaine, LSD, ecstasy, marijuana, methamphetamine, heroin, and much more. By 2011, one single website is the world's largest underground network of illegal drug trafficking. Instead of cash, buyers and sellers trade Bitcoin, a digital cryptocurrency that uses a decentralized network to create anonymous transactions across the blockchain. All around the world, Hundreds of thousands of anonymous buyers flock to the Silk Road and trade Bitcoin for any drug they can find, all mailed right to their front door. You're a Dutch programmer based in Voorde, a small city, only an hour-long train ride from Amsterdam. You've just graduated college, but after an unsuccessful attempt at medical school, you take a job you don't love. Life feels mundane. You're only 21, but you feel stuck. That is, until March of 2012. Under the alias, you sell your first half gram of ecstasy on the Silk Road. Your country is a world leader in the manufacturing of illegal synthetic drugs. You know who's making them, and online, you know who wants them. So you have a plan. Buy ecstasy in Amsterdam for cheap, sell it around the world for a higher price, and cash in the difference. People are going to buy drugs anyway. Why can't you supply them? There's a world of customers waiting, and you can be the middleman. Suddenly, you don't feel so stuck. You make some phone calls. You ride the train to Amsterdam. Back in your apartment, you set on your kitchen table a packet of vacuum sealed bags, a box of empty DVD cases and a half kilo of ecstasy. Printed on each pill is your super trip's signature, a green question mark. You get to work.
you're with your friends at a college bar in Athens, Georgia. One of your friends, Jimmy, just bought the whole group another round of shots. This is how you met Jimmy. You're a college student who's been riding on the coattails of his generosity for months. He buys everyone drinks. He throws parties at the lake house. He rents out private jets and flies everyone to five-star hotel. He says he got his fortune selling Bitcoin. Nobody questions it. In return, all Jimmy seems to want is friends. He once confided in you that he didn't have many friends growing up. He got bullied a lot, and so he's glad to have you. You've used this to your advantage. You overhear him saying he'll be out of town for the week. This is your opportunity. When you arrive at Jimmy's house that night, all his lights are off. His driveway is empty. You work your way around the back of the house and use a hammer to break the window. When you climb inside, you already know where to go. Jimmy bragged about the roughly $1 million worth of cash and bitcoins he kept hidden behind his chimney. He seemed eager to impress you. You easily find the stash. Out the window, carrying $1 million in your arms, you escape into the night. When the stiff winds blow, the black don't ripple in the party of special things to do. I'm the ace of love. You're racing your Mercedes Benz through your Vorden neighborhood. When you open your garage door, your BMW and Audi are waiting for you. Your neighbors are suspicious. What 22-year-old can afford these expensive cars? You tell your friends and family you own a software company. But no one knows you've been building an empire. Under the name Super Trips, you've sold over half a million ecstasy pills and 100 kilos of MDMA. You've expanded your inventory. Cocaine, benzodiazepine, LSD, methamphetamine, ketamine, and Xanax. You have a team who makes and delivers the drugs to you. You package them in DVD cases and ship them all around the world. Your customers are happy. The Dutch police can't touch you. You've earned over $3 million in Bitcoin. Any trace in your life of feeling stuck has vanished. A brand new game I want to lay on you. I miss it all. That's a party of special things to do. When I was a dud, I was far from through. I returned to the ease of love. With only a laptop, an iPhone, and a backpack, you've become the most prolific online drug dealer in history and no one even knows your name. But across the Atlantic Ocean, trouble is brewing. An American senator wants to shut the Silk Road down. The DEA and Department of Justice are catching on and seizing orders that arrive in America. Users on the Silk Road are getting nervous. But you're too busy to worry about this. Your customer base keeps growing. So you just keep working. It's 2020. You're an IRS criminal investigator based in New York. You specialize in digital and decentralized finance crimes. The Silk Road has been defunct for more than seven years and its founder is in prison. But not everything is resolved. 
and the vast database of encrypted transactions the US government confiscated, something is missing. Something huge. Between 2012 and 2014, using an exploit in the Silk Road's withdrawal process, a hacker stole more than 51,000 bitcoins from other users. Now, the value of these bitcoins has grown to more than $3 billion. Every transaction on the blockchain is public, but it's anonymous. You followed through the Silk Road's network of threads showing every coin that's been stolen, but you can't tell who owns them. You have to wait for the owner to make a mistake and reveal themselves. But whoever carried out the heist knew what they were doing. Your team thinks the hacker mixed the stolen coins where, like money laundering, individuals take stolen cryptocurrency and mix them together with other legally obtained currency, hiding the stolen currency's origin. It's making your job much harder. You don't have much to go on. You worry these past seven years have been wasted. That is, until your team flags something interesting. Whoever owns the stolen bitcoins transferred a small amount, roughly $800 worth, into an exchange that has a KYC, or Know Your Customer Policy. Whoever creates an account on their exchange must use their full name and address. That $800 worth of Bitcoin is a small portion of the $3 billion heist, but whoever stole it has given you a thread to follow. For the hacker, it's a critical mistake. For you, it's the best lead you have yet. You subpoena the exchange for the account's identity. The account is registered by a man named Jimmy, based in Athens, Georgia. As it so happens, you already have a file on Jimmy. He was a part of the first wave of Bitcoin adopters in 2009. He even made original contributions to the Bitcoin code, reducing the size and increasing the efficiency of the blockchain. No one knows how much he stashed away, but last year he filed a police report. A thief broke into his house and stole an obscene amount of Bitcoins from him. Your team wondered how Jimmy grabbed such a large pile of money. But now you know. You have a thread that connects him directly to the Silk Road heist. But it's not enough evidence. You have to find a way to get to his computer and access his Bitcoin wallet. You have to take a trip down south. You and two other men on your team pull up to Jimmy's lake house in Gainesville, Georgia. You knock on a mosaic glass door. Jimmy swings it open and shakes your hand. He seems happy to see you. You told him you and your team were here to help him find out who stole his $1 million. You haven't told him the real reason you're here. You're investigating him for the $3 billion worth of stolen Bitcoins. Jimmy shows you around his house. He shows you his dog, the stripper pole in his basement, his view of the lake, his room full of computer servers, his security system, his newly tiled floors, his assault rifle, the flamethrower he keeps mounted on the wall. And as he shows you all this, it's obvious he's lonely. Not too many of his friends have come to visit after the robbery. He's glad to have company. You use this to your advantage. 
you and your team chat with him, make him feel like you're his friend. You get him so comfortable that he opens up his laptop and shows you his Bitcoin wallet. On his screen, you see $70 million worth of Bitcoins. He says that's only a tiny amount of what he owns. As you leave his home at the end of the day, you know that this evidence, combined with the KYC exchange account, is enough to connect everything together for a search warrant. But it won't be so easy. There's no telling, once you seize the laptop, if you can get past the layers of encryption and security Jimmy has set up. You have to find a way to trick him into giving you access and then pull him away from the computer before he can lock you out. Good thing you have a plan. You're sitting alone in one of the customs interview rooms in the Miami International Airport. You're tired. You've been tired for months. The stress of keeping your empire together has taken its toll. You've been working 16-hour days nonstop. Dutch police keep knocking on your door. Not to mention, you've been sampling your stockpile of drugs in your home back in Vorda. In this stuffy, windowless room, you sweat and shake from withdrawal. You're in Miami because you want out. Another Silk Road trader by the alias has offered to buy your empire. You've worked together for a while. You trust him. And honestly, you're more than willing to give up the business and unburden yourself. You've already earned more than 385,000 Bitcoins, and their value is only rising by the day. You stop checking how much they're worth. It's more than enough to retire on. In your backpack, you have the laptop you'll use to finalize the change of hands. You're also carrying $20,000 in cash to rent a Lamborghini. It's a nice way to celebrate retirement at the age of 22. You assume the cash is why you've been detained. A small group of men in suits enter the room. One flashes you his badge. They're with Homeland Security. They waste no time telling you what they know. A year ago, customs officers in Chicago found and seized over 100 envelopes mailed from Europe, all of them carrying DVD cases. Inside each case was a sealed bag of ecstasy with green question marks on the pills. On one case, they found your fingerprints. Catching underground syndicate was the easy part, the agent explains. You're the bigger fish they've been after. Another agent asks if you'd like to be referred to as super trips. As the world spins around you, you know that you're stuck again. But this time, you can't work yourself free. You and your team arrive at Jimmy's door. He greets you, lets you in. You're friendly, he's friendly. You tell him you're here to continue investigating his home robbery. He just needs to answer a few more questions. Jimmy doesn't know that hiding just out of view down the street is an entire team of police officers waiting for their cue. You make sure he's comfortable again. You crack jokes. You laugh at his. You ask if he can pull up his wallet again. 
you need to verify that the stolen $600,000 worth of Bitcoin was truly his. You watch him sit on the couch and open his laptop. He types his password. An agent on your team stands between Jimmy and the front door. Another sits beside Jimmy on the couch. They both look at you. With Jimmy's account open, now is the perfect time to issue the search warrant. You need to announce that you're investigating him. You glance at Jimmy, resting on the wall above him, just within arm's reach, is the flamethrower. You look out the balcony door to the view of the lake. You pretend to struggle with a sliding glass door, and you ask Jimmy for help. Jimmy sets the laptop on the coffee table, still open on his account. The two of you walk out to gaze at the water. It's a nice view. Jimmy is smiling. You enjoy one another's company for a brief moment. It's here you admit that you're an agent with the IRS and you specialize in criminal investigations. You're not here to help Jimmy find whoever robbed his house. You're here to execute a warrant concerning $3 billion worth of stolen Bitcoin. Jimmy stares at you. One second passes, then another. The team of waiting officers flood through the house. They seize the laptop, the servers, the weapons. They sledgehammer the newly tiled floors to reveal an underground safe where Jimmy stashed $661,900 in cash, 174 bitcoins, and multiple silver and gold bars. But in the bathroom closet, stuffed inside a Cheetos popcorn tin, is what you've all been searching for. Wrapped in a blanket in a single board computer holding all 50,000 stolen bitcoins. After seven years of following all the threads, you're finally holding the missing $3 billion in your hands. You're sitting alone in the Chicago O'Hare International Airport. The same airport where, years ago, American authorities seized your packages of MDMA. It seems like a lifetime ago. For the past seven years, you've been shoved around the American prison system, spending your youth stuck in a prison cell, and then another, and another. The Silk Road is dead. Your empire is crumbled. All your funds have been seized. All you have is a one-way ticket back to the Netherlands, where your girlfriend and your mother are waiting. For the first time in years, you're free. Your gate hasn't started boarding yet. The television screen above you is playing the news. A man in Georgia pleads guilty to one count of wire fraud. His name is Jimmy. He was a hacker on the Silk Road. He tells the judge that having all that money made him feel important. You find yourself nodding. Because Jimmy let the US government have the $3 billion worth of stolen Bitcoin, and on top of that, every source of wealth in his name, he sentenced to only one year in prison. If you hadn't exchanged your stash of Bitcoins for a lighter sentence, you'd be a billionaire too. This is the price you paid for freedom. The front desk announces that your group is boarding. As you and all the other passengers stroll through the boarding bridge to the awaiting plane, you can't help but understand how Jimmy feels. And you want to tell him that he isn't alone. Said low, a 
Why should I go? Should I jump through hoops in the January snow? I said bad, she said good, but I knew that she would Running circles around me, pick me up when I'm low 